And without further ado, I want to kick off our first Spotlight talk. I'm really excited about this. Mike Troiano is a friend and mentor. He's a venture capitalist at a firm called G20 Ventures, uh, previously served as CMO of Actifio, which is uh, a large enterprise technology company outside of Boston. He grew that to over a billion dollars in valuation. Uh, and they are the leader in copy data visualization. Who loves copy data visualization, OK? Mike was the guy that marketed copy data visualization and made it exciting. I don't even know if it's called that, but I think roughly it was in that realm. And, uh, and so if Mike can market copy data visualization, I think he can definitely share uh, some insights with us. And uh, Mike is reflective of the major donor of the future that all of you are trying to build relationships with. And so he wanted to give you a window into his world. Welcome, Mike. Uh, can I just get that clicker? All right, how's everybody doing today? Uh, Brent Grinna with a characteristically low energy kickoff there. Um, pretty glad to be here. So um, my name is Mike Triano, and uh, I'm a venture capitalist. And this is the firm that I'm a part of. Um, what, what Brent basically said is, is I'm here at this conference. Um, and, and I know less about higher education, capital development, than 90% of the people in the room. So we figured I would talk first. Um, I, uh, I am uh, an uh, alumnus, though, of two great institutions of higher learning. Uh, Cornell. Um, any Cornell people in the room? Go red. Uh, and uh, HBS. And um, uh, at Cornell, I, uh, I played football, and I threw the hammer on the track team. And uh, this um, picture was posted on Facebook. Uh, that's me with hair. Um, a long time ago, we were heptagonal champions in 1988, trying to live in the now, but it's a glory days kind of thing. Uh, and they posted this, and they, they tagged us all, and it was a way to kind of like bring us back to college, which is what a lot of you folks do. Give us that moment of, of kind of nostalgia. Um, and, and, you know, it is an emotional uh, relationship that we have with the universities we were at as young people. Um, uh, this guy, uh, Tony Soprano, any Sopranos fans in the room? So among the many pearls of wisdom from this show um, was, was this, this quote uh, that stuck with me for whatever reason, uh, but, but Tony said uh, at a place in Florida at this restaurant where he was talking to some people, remember when is the lowest form of conversation? Um, and, and I think that that's true. And, and I would contrast what you just saw in the beginning with this. So Brent and I were at dinner on May 23rd, um, and we were chatting about this conference. And HBS um, picked this up on Twitter and broadcasted it to all the people who follow HBS. Um, that Brent and I had been together. They obviously, a lot goes into this, right? They got to know who their alumni are in the social network. They took a minute to kind of promote ourselves. Like, we're all on these social networks as a means of personal branding. Uh, so we enhance our visibility as professionals. And HBS kind of stepped in um, and amplified uh, our presence with this note. And, and both of us sort of you know, appreciated that. It generates some goodwill towards them uh, in the present. Um, on April 23rd, a month before, I attended a conference at MIT, uh, a lesser university to Cornell, uh, but a local one. Uh, it was called Business of Blockchain. And uh, blockchain is a big thing happening in, in the world. I'm sure you've all heard of Bitcoin, and like you're seeing all this noise and excitement. It's sort of the new internet in the venture space. And they did this big um, event. Uh, it was, it was $2,700 an attendee, which is a lot of money. And the thing sold out in like 48 hours. Um, they reached out to me and invited me. You know, I, I would say, you know, not because I'm charming, but because I'm a venture capitalist. Uh, and they wanted to have a bunch of us there. But I appreciated that gesture. Um, and I contrast that with you know, this fantastic uh, tech campus that Cornell is building in New York. Um, which we're, I'm sure there's a lot of smart people thinking about this blockchain stuff. I'm sure there's a lot of people like me, Cornellians, who are in the venture business. And the number of invitations that I've received to participate in all this goodness is, is rounds up to zero. 
All right, so, so what am I saying? Um, Brent asked me to come in and, and, and not to speak about development, but to speak as an alum. Like, how do we feel? What does it feel like out in the world? And, and what it feels like to me um, is that, that you're talking to the guy on the right and not to the guy on the left. And the guy on the right, while handsome, was broke. Um, and, and the guy on the left, while less so, is not. Um, so, um, so I guess that's really the point that I wanted to make, um, is that reaching out to the guy um, on the left, the guy in the present, um, is really about accepting a few hard truths. Um, nostalgia has value, but, but I think increasingly in today's world, the people in this room, the forward thinkers on the left side of that chasm, need to begin to recognize that nostalgia in some ways is a crutch. You need to move beyond that if you're going to get people excited enough to get behind the universities they attended as young people. It's there. It gives you a hunting license to reach out to folks. People are going to open the email for the most part. But you have to move beyond that to connect with me in the present, to differentiate from all the other people who want something from me, uh, and to win in the support of the resources you need to advance your universities. Um, I would encourage you, as an alum, to focus on relevance in my life today. Focus on utility. What are the places that you can add value, support me in the objectives that I have as an adult, not in the memories that I have as a young man? Um, and, and part of that for me, this has always been like a, a thing that, that, that bothered me. You know, let's move beyond geography. Um, you know, when I get appeals from universities, it's usually like, well, it's the, you know, lower Wellesley, you know, alumni, so like whatever. And, you know, I, I can go to that and like, you know, hobnob with like, you know, other people. Um, but, but why not think in terms of, of verticals? Like, and there's plenty of other ways to think about the ways to group alumni. But, but I probably at this point have more in common with other VC alums, of which there are a great many. Um, at Cornell than I do with, with necessarily other folks in Boston who have very different jobs, very different lives for the most part. So use that. Use that for your benefit. Um, and I think the likelihood that your appeals will be greater is, is that much higher. All right, so it's so, so all very theoretical. But what are some ideas? Well, what does that mean, Mike? Uh, you know, we have this alumni thing. We know what we're doing. It's going pretty well, right? Well, here are just some ideas. This is like to, you know, a few minutes of thought. Like, you know, bringing together people, like do an alumni thing, not around a trip to Norway for people who are 70 and, o and over. Um, it, nothing against Norway. Um, lovely, lovely place. Um, but like a blockchain, artificial intelligence, SaaS, additive manufacturing, like a conference around a topic of interest in, in the vertical of which I am a part. You know, an online course, Cryptocurrency 101. Like, there's plenty of alumni who hear about this Bitcoin thing. There's a lot of energy, and people want to learn about it. Um, they want to they wanna learn. You guys are in the learning business. So learn them, um, <laughs> as they say in Iowa. Um, uh, alumni VC referral networks. How can you knit us together in ways that create value, that deliver utility, that support us in the lives we have today as the people we are today? Alumni entrepreneur clubs, industry influencer, ask me anything. I'm not going to read the list. You get the idea. How do you go through that mindset shift to say, look, nostalgia is great, and we got that down. You guys understand how to leverage nostalgia. You have a system set up. Getting to the next level for me is about, again, delivering this idea of utility. Um, I have a notebook. I carry it with me everywhere. It says MIT on it. Breaks my heart just a little bit, um, but it's a good notebook. The paper's nice. They gave it to me. Um, I have a sense of, of gratitude. But again, it's indicative. Um, and it's not just about tchotchke. It's not just about premiums. But it's about finding ways to play a role, a visible role, in the life of your alumni today. Um, that makes the development conversation that much more interesting. Um, you know, I'm a marketing guy, so I'm a visual guy. And as I reflected on this, I thought, you know, there's this old model where, where you have this kind of broad-based memory. We all have a recollection of Cornell and my fraternity before it was thrown off unceremoniously. Um, that gives us a sense of obligation. Cornell changed my life. It really did. 
Um, and, I, and I do have a sense of, of obligation. I have periodic contact with the university. I go back to homecoming. Um, there is a systemic institutional ask of me. The phone rings. It's from Ithaca. I know what they want. It's not to say hello. Um, and that engenders a gift of support. Well, I would submit to you that in addition to making that model more, um, more um, you know, productive, you can apply some cycles to a new model, which starts off with a targeted experience in the present. Something that, again, adds value to my life today. Generate authentic value. Focus on creating something of value in the lives of your alums. That will engender a sense of goodwill on the part of those people. Um, that will inspire them to make an individual offer of support, and that will get you to your gift. Um, it's a different way to think about um, this whole journey. And, and I would say it's a different way for a different world. Okay? You know, this is happening as the whole world is changing. You know, in the old model, you know, people decided they were going to major in geology and go be a geologist. Um, today, we, we live in a world where, you know, your career is a portfolio of experiences, maybe a portfolio of industries. Um, I, I, you know, in 1988, it was about graduate and monetize. I'm going to leverage my liberal arts education and go get a job. Um, Today, I'm in sort of lifelong learning mode. I'm constantly reading, I'm constantly feeling behind, trying to catch up, trying to be smarter about the things that affect my life. Um, in the old world, retraining was something you did in an emergency when they shut down the coal mine. Um, in the new world, we all go through processes of periodic renewal, where we're trying to get on another curve. We're trying to participate in a new opportunity in the world. So, so it just strikes me that, that I'm asking you to sort of play a role in the present, even as the needs of alumni are shifting in a world that requires them to constantly be educated, not to be nostalgic for an education experience that happened in their late teens and early 20s, but to look for ways to re-engage in a process of lifelong learning. Um, and, and I have no greater affinity for any institution in the pursuit of those goals than I do for my own. All right, um, today, from the perspective of alumni, um, a lot of what you guys do feels like a hard knock in the door from someone that I know what they want, I know they want something, and, and um, it's, it, it, it's, not, it's not a great experience for me, and it's not as productive as it could be for you. Um, there is uh, an expression um, in, in among Italians, I'm not sure if it's Italian or Italian American, but but the idea is that um, you know when friends come to visit, they arrive with uh, you know they got a pizza and a bottle of wine, and they um, friends knock with their feet, um, show up with something, deliver value in the life of your alums, engage them, uh, generate goodwill through through this value add, you know knock with your feet. And I think your alumni are much more likely to open the door. All right, with that, I want to bring Brent back up for some Q&A. I think um, one of the, the topics that uh, I wanted to pick your brain on is this idea in the for-profit sales and marketing world uh, where it used to be you bought a piece of software, you owned it forever, uh, and, and that was just the way things operated, it created much less of an of incentive for uh, the companies to nurture relationships for, forever because you'd already bought the software, yeah. right? Yep. We've shifted into this world of software as a service, subscription economy. Many of you subscribe to uh, companies in your personal lives like Netflix uh, or companies like Evertrue in your professional lives. And with that shift in particular around um, the for-profit sales and marketing world, there's been a massive investment in this concept called customer success. Courtney, our MC, introduced herself as our VP of customer success. Every Evertrue client here, hopefully you can name your customer success manager um, because you've had a bunch of interactions together. And I think that's a piece where, where it's clear, and we'll talk about this throughout the, the rest of the conference, alumni relations is sort of the marketing world of this sector. Development is the sales world. And then when you say, well, what's the customer success equivalent in this sector? 
it sounds like in your case, that's been missing a little bit. Whose job is it to proactively say once a year, you said, I know what the phone call needs, and they're not calling to ask to help. What if they were? And, and what do you think about that shift you've seen in your portfolio, in your investments, and then how that might apply to the world of Cornell? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's exactly right. I think, and that set of experiences that we have in our professional lives affects our expectation of the, uh, you know, uh, charitable, gi charitable giving aspect of our life. And, and I do feel like this new generation of companies recognizes it has a stake in the success of, of its customers. You know, it's no longer about transactions, now it's about relationships. You know, you guys at the end of the day are in the relationship business. You understand relationships. Um, I guess I'm just asking you to apply that through a new lens. And, and this lens, Brent is describing it exactly, it is, you know, the customer success function is called that because it's about helping your customers be successful. Um, and, and, and look, I, I want to be very clear about this. Like, I, like, my college experience did so much to help me in that I do have goodwill towards Cornell. I do support it. Um, but, but this is about, like, like, how would I respond to a proactive effort on their part to, you know, introduce me to entrepreneurs or to help me get educated about some facet of, of new technology that was relevant or to engage with other VCs even, to get down to that shiny new uh, facility in New York um, and feel like it's part of, I'm part of it. You know, we're, we, we live in a tribal time. Um, I would say dark days for the Republic, but... Um, <laughs> But we live in a time of tribes and tribal loyalty, and, and we all have loyalty to that tribe of, of college. The question is, how do you activate that? You know, how do you turn it into something that's relevant today to drive action today? I think it's about looking for ways to help me be successful, to help me realize value uh, in, in my participation in that institution and in, and in the tribe that it represents. So let's ignore your jobs as advancement professionals, but let's just for a minute think about you all as alumni of your respective institutions. How many of you from your undergraduate institution, maybe before you worked in advancement, got a call or a solicitation to give in the way that Mike described? How many of you have received a phone call, an email, an ask? Raise them high, okay. How many of you have on your journey received outreach from your institution where somebody said, hey, Nick, I'd love to schedule a few minutes to catch up on what's going on in your life to see if there might be a way we can help you. How many of you have had that kind of proactive outreach from your institution just checking in to see if they can help? Raise them really high, because hopefully there are, raise them really high. You raised it really high, which makes me feel like you want to say something. You, and, and would you say that that is great for everyone or great for board members? It's great for everyone. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. And so there is some precedent. But there weren't that many hands that went up, and I think that's a lot of what, you know, it, it could be knock with your feet or, or, or it could be call uh, with, with support once in a while. And I think the question that a lot of these uh, folks would wrestle with is, but Mike, how do we do that? You know, we've got to hit our revenue goals. We've yeah. got to hit that annual fund number. How do we fire up a team of people focused on getting you speaking about cryptocurrency 101 to the Cornell alumni population? We don't have the time and money for that. Yeah. No, I, I think um, as with anything in life, you know, as two entrepreneurs, it comes down to priorities. Um, and, and I think, you know, look, there are clusters of, of, you know, professional archetype in your universe of alums. You really have to know those people. Let me start with that. That part of this is you've got to have the technology to manage those relationships and to understand the relevant personal and professional attributes of your alums. And you've got to have that data available in a way that is actionable to you. So there is a basic level of systems and infrastructure that's important, uh, which is one of the reasons I've always been excited about what, what these guys are doing. Um, but beyond that, it, it's about like saying, okay, like let's pick a couple of professional roles. Let's think about a way that, that you know, I'll, I'll tell you like, again, I'm gonna try to make this as personal as possible. Um, every VC who's a, an alumni of your university, and some of you have more of those than others, is looking to raise money every few years. 
That is an opportune time to reach out to those people and, and, I, and look for ways to make introductions to other high net worth alumni or to socialize them in different ways. Right? So just having, a, having that, adding that attribute to your database, who is a venture capitalist, who's a principal in those firms, and again, these are people likely to have the resources required to really provide that active support. What is their fundraising cycle? When are they raising their next fund? Or pay attention to what they're saying on social media to understand that. And then proactively reach out. You know, this, this aspect of it, I recognize that it doesn't scale. I recognize that, that it has all the uncertainty of real human contact. But that is also the source of its impact and its power. Uh, because again, at the end of the day, um, this is about activating a relationship, not just about driving a transaction. Deep thoughts from Mike. Let's thank him. Thanks, Mike. <laughs>